Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar organized by Solar Plaza. The webinar is called Financing Dutch Solar PV Projects, and we're going to talk about insights into the changing landscape. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Edwin Cota. I'm the CEO of Solar Plaza, founder of Solar Plaza, and it's a pleasure to host this uh, webinar with uh, you and uh, two special guests. Um, actually, the special guests are quite familiar to us, to Solar Plaza, and I guess also to some of you. They're very senior experts in the solar PV market. Um, first is uh, Floris Leufting. He's the investment director of Klimaatfonds Netherlands. Has a tremendous re track record in solar PV in various positions. He will uh, I will introduce him later on a little bit further for you. And uh, the second one is Willem Biesheuvel. He is head of project management at Groenleuven. Also very long track record and extensive experience in floating PV. Uh, more about that later on. Um, welcome to everybody. Uh, it's a special webinar and we're going to talk about the challenging landscape um, in the Netherlands uh, with respect to financing. What we have on schedule, I just shared a little bit about Solar Plaza, just some commercial from our side. Uh, for those who don't know us, we are uh, existing since 2004 and we have organized more than 150 events across 41 countries in the world and the international um, network of uh, connections that we have in the solar industry. And the Corona crisis brought also something good for us, uh, not being able to execute all these live events. We were, uh, we have founded two new branches and one is a Solar Plaza consultancy. I won't go into detail for that, but feel free to, to reach out to us about this uh, consultancy branch. And the second one is the Solar Plaza Academy because uh, knowledge sharing is probably, uh, according to, to our uh, conviction, um, and um, we believe that the, that the energy transition can only be possible if we share more knowledge, and which actually is one of the key drivers to our belief to make that energy transition accelerate. Um, and for those uh, who know, um, we already started in 2019 with our own Solar Plaza Foundation to accelerate the sustainable energy transition for the less privileged in this world. Um, if you have an interest to share and, and join us in that mission, feel free to reach out to uh, our Solar Plaza Foundation. There's a special website for this too. Okay, practical notes um, before we go ahead. Uh, there's a possibility, of course, and we would like you to interactively join these discussions. There is a question box on the right side in your menu. You can send in questions. We will collect them and we'll try to answer them after the presentations. Um, maybe during the presentations, the speakers might invite you to raise a hand. There is also a possibility to raise a hand and to uh, join a discussion during the, the presentation. But otherwise, please save your questions or send in your questions at any time and we will discuss them after the presentations. There's also a chat box, so if you have any technical issues, uh, feel free to reach out to uh, this Q&A chat box and my colleague will try to answer that and help you ASCP. Um, for you to know, uh, if you want to share your, the slides, full recordings with colleagues afterwards, uh, we will share a link uh, within one or two days so you can spread the message and spread the good news that we will share during this uh, webinar. Um, as I told you, one of our guests is Willem Biesheuvel. Um, he is head of project management at Groenleuven. I think uh, most uh, familiar to, to most of you, uh, one of the leading stakeholders in the Dutch market. He has a, an extensive experience, mainly also in, in, in floating PV, one of the um, rising topics in the Dutch market. Has more than 20 years of international experience in marketing and sales and uh, in, in various branches, in various industries. And he worked not only in the Netherlands, but also in the UK and lived for a couple of years in Australia. Um, welcome, Willem. And uh, next to that, we have Floris. He is the investment director of Klimaatfonds Nederland. And Floris, Floris is not only the investment director, he was also a co-founder of Klimaatfonds, responsible for investments and fundraising. And prior to that um, position, Floris spent over 12 years as a solar energy finance investment and development expert. Um, for several stakeholders, several players like PwC, Energy, and Sunrock. And Flores was involved in development, finance, and acquisition of large scale projects in uh, Europe um, with a value of over 300 million. Um, welcome, Flores. Welcome, Willem. And before we go to uh, the presentation of Klimaatfonds, I would like to start 
with a uh, poll question. So to inter have an interaction with you in the audience, you can uh, make your votes and click on one of the uh, answers to this question. What do you see as the major challenges for project financing? And then especially in the Netherlands. So please make your votes in the meantime. Floris, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. How are things going with you? Very fine, thanks. Yeah, you're you're not going to share your answer to this poll question. Uh, you're going to talk about this later on. Is there anything? Uh, yeah, we, let, let's discuss a little bit about this uh, uh, this cost and, and the, the evergreen that was blocking the the, the Suez Channel. W was that kind of the uh, one of the issues that was uh, most apparent last year, or are there all other things happening uh, which impact wow. the Dutch PV uh, market? Well, we can say that this was one of the maybe 100 issues that we faced last year, uh, leading to increased prices. Uh, um, so we had coal central, uh, coal power plants uh, shutting down in China. Uh, we had a lack of uh, uh, silicium, lack of glass, lack of aluminium, basically um, uh, lack of labor, uh, increasing costs of transportation, not only due to the Suez uh, Channel, of course. Um, but there, yeah, we faced many issues, um, especially in the supply chain. Okay. Well, in the meantime, Flores, we see the results of the poll question. Um, and interesting enough, uh, but uh, that's also up to you to discuss that in your presentation. Grid connection issues uh, has been is seen as uh, the major challenge for project financing. Um, any first reaction, or are you going to share it more in your presentation? Yeah, I, I don't see that as a project uh, as a project financing issue, um, since when the project is uh, ready for construction, the grid connection should be solved by then, um, and then we face all other kinds of problems for uh, to finance the project. Yeah, I think this is more a major challenge in the project development. Of course, you need to have it, otherwise you can't finance it. But uh, I think the first three issues uh, mentioned here in the slide are. Uh, much bigger issues for the financing side of the project. Okay, well, let's hear more. Uh, floor is yours, uh, so please take it ahead with your presentation. Okay, I'll also switch on my camera. I guess you can see me now, uh, at the end. Yes. Do I have control over the slides? Yes. Although the font has changed slightly, so I have to get used to our new, uh, 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 new type of uh, uh, presentation. Um, I will talk about a, a short introduction about myself, about Klimaatfonds Nederland, a few key market trends that we identified uh, in the financing of projects, uh, a little bit on the political landscape and how the changing business case actually is evolving and how we can still finance these type of projects. Um, so about Klimaatfonds Nederland. Um, and about myself, Edwin, I saw that on your slide, I worked 12 years in the solar. I was thinking about it this morning and actually it's coming March. It's been 15 years already, so we need slight updating. I'm getting old, getting gray as well. Um, after, uh, after these 15 years, I've seen, yeah, I've seen many markets within Europe uh, in the project development side, from project financing side, um, but the late 2018, we saw that the Dutch market was lacking uh, not only capital, but also uh, knowledge and experience. And we co-founded, uh, or I co-founded, Klimaatfonds uh, Nederland, translated as Climate Fund uh, Netherlands. Um, you can see it basically as a sort of a late stage developer um, and then acquiring, utilizing and operating large scale projects. Um, what we do is um, attract basically capital and link it to projects uh, and cooperate with local developers. And so we have several partnerships with, with, with developers that created basically that lead it to an extended uh, and exclusive pipeline. Um, since our establishment in late 2018, uh, we have now 112 megawatts operational. So it's all in the Netherlands and it's all ground mounted solar. We are looking at the uh, rooftop project portfolios as well, but the focus now is uh, on, on uh, ground mounted. We currently have already also 75 megawatts under construction um, and a lot of uh, projects ready to finance, um, but facing 
all kinds of different problems. Uh, each project is different, but we do see um, yeah, a lot of problems arising that we're trying to see how we can solve this and how we can finance these projects in the near future. So just to focus a little bit on where we come into play. So we have the development side of, uh, of projects and that is really the, the, at the game of the local developers. Um, we come into play basically when the project is ready to build. So that's why I said uh, the grid connection is not necessarily our biggest problem in the financing of the, problem, of the projects, um, but we see all the, basically all the other issues. Um, so we finance the project, structure it, um, and, and make sure that it's been operated for the project lifetime, basically. Just a small snapshot of the projects and the locations that we have. You see in the center, KF, that's our office. Somehow we manage that all projects are at least one and a half hours driving distance from our office. So please, if anyone has a project that is close by, it will help us a lot and save us a lot of electrical kilometers. So just to focus on a few market threats, uh, so we don't have a lot of time for the presentation. It's, it's, well, the idea is to get it, of course, a bit more interactive later on. So I'll focus just on the three, uh, three key issues, which the first is uh, SDE plus development. Uh, so what we saw is a, a large increase in the total budget, which is the purple bluish uh, uh, in, in, in this graph. And you see in the, the black line is the decrease in the, in the tariff, which of course makes sense. Projects became much cheaper to build. Uh, CapEx was a lot lower, but we also saw a decrease in the tariff, but we also saw a decrease in the total budget available as of 2018, which makes perfect sense because if the tariff is less, uh, you can still build the same amount of projects with less budget available. The problem here basically is that we have, of course, in 2015-16, we had biomass entering the SDE system. Uh, 2021, we had the CCS, CCU projects also being able to make use of the same SDE plus budget, um, leading to, well, this is just an estimate from us uh, that there will be very little that will be granted to solar projects, you'll see in the, in the yellow bars. Um, but for 2022, we are a bit, well, we have more hope, so to say. Of course, tariff will de decline a bit further, but maybe not as steep as it used to be. Um, there are, well, it's not even a rumor, but uh, the idea is that the total budget will be increased again. Um, so this looks positive, but on the other hand, of course, we have, well, we face other problems. Um, this is not a really a problem, but this is more, well, could be part of the solution. Um, as we saw the electricity market developments, as you all know, and as you have probably also noticed in your own electricity bill, have increased after the first dip, basically we had uh, post-corona. Um, I don't know why the text in one, two, and three have disappeared, but um, so we saw a dip, but we saw as of that moment, post-corona, a very steady increase uh, towards prices, day ahead prices of uh, 430 uh, euros per megawatt hour even, but also steep declines. So what we saw is a, is a steady increase, but also much more volatility. Um, and this is just a day ahead market, but of course the intraday, you see much bigger differences. Of course, nobody knows how this is going to end. As we, as we look back in 10 to 15 years of electricity prices, we always saw increases and decrease, but we've never seen it. Let's say this extreme. Could it be part of the solution or not? We don't know. Let's see. Then we have something that probably everyone in the well of, of the attendees of the of the webinar have faced, um, which is the development of the EPC prices. Looking back when I started in 2007, if you put basically all the, the average EPC prices in a line, you see a uh, quite a decent decrease or, or, or a steady decrease of around 15% per year. Um, and this has been, you know, there, of course there were annual differences because of uh, import tariffs, et cetera, but uh, on average, you will always see this decrease until of course uh, last year when prices suddenly started increasing due to, well, some of the reasons we just mentioned as well. Uh, but how this is going to evolve, nobody knows. Oh, at least if there's 
someone of the attendees who does know, uh, please let me know as well. Um, but this is, of course, something that we're facing. Uh, we're facing the inflation, we're facing increasing tariffs and in, in interest. Um, we're facing increasing EPC prices, but we're also facing decreasing SDE tariffs. And so somehow, or at, at some point, it doesn't work anymore to just finance projects with a simple SDE um, and, and just use the, uh, well, the low EPC prices. A little bit on the political landscape. I'll just go quickly over this because I don't want to dive too much into the detail. But what we see is that, um, you know, the current government in place, it took all, uh, as most of you probably know, at least a year to form the uh, ad, to form this government. It is one of the greenest coalitions ever. We do have a climate accord, which is very positive because it has the involvement of many stakeholders, but it somehow not always works well in, you know, with, with the, how the market is evolving. Uh, we have the uh, regional energy strategies. Each region has said, okay, let's, you know, we want this much of solar, this much of wind, um, but not taking into account the grid problems that are there on, the, on, on a local basis, not taking into account that SDE might even just disappear or might not be sufficient. Um, so why not place solar and wind next to large off-takers, for example, this has not been taken into account. So you see basically that the will is there, and the, the political willingness to promote uh, uh, solar and wind. But on the other hand, the market is always evolving faster than, um, than politics. Of course, this has always been the case, but in solar, it goes so quick that the legislation is always lagging behind. And how they try to solve it is just by implementing more rules, more legislation, more regulation, which in the end leads to only basically further slowing it down. So we see changing business case. Just to put the two lines, just to give you an idea of uh, um, the SDE, or, or this is the maximum SDE tariff that was applicable each year, um, and the evolution of the uh, EPC prices. So we see a sudden increase in 2021 and towards 2022 this year, we see a lot of higher prices. Um, what we also see is that with, with the current SDE levels, most pro and the current EPC levels, basically most projects are not financeable. Or maybe the, they are just with the current interest rates, but if interest rates would increase further, your project is not financeable anymore. So that yes, so we're gonna yeah. do a poll question now. Uh, yes. And yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to ask the attendees basically. So how, you know, how where do you think the solution is at taking this changing business case into account? Where do you think changing this business case? Um, how can we still finance these? Can we make use of the high electricity prices currently? Can we use battery storage? Can we use hydrogen storage? Um, do we just have to wait for EPC price to go down? As we have seen, of course, in the, well, for all the past years with the high SDE and developers or investors waited just for, let's say, two, three, four years to, uh, for price to go down and you had a good business case. Um, but now basically nobody knows what's gonna happen. So I would like to have your opinion on, on where we should look for the solution. Good, good question. So please all uh, join in this voting. As you can see, um, the organizers cannot vote, so we won't put a vote in, in there. Um, I'm waiting for a couple more seconds on your uh, answers. And there they are. Floris, you can discuss them uh, briefly. Yeah, so we see that well, it would be good to hear uh, to hear other as well, of course. Uh, maybe in the discussion afterwards, we can uh, pinpoint that. Um, but direct sales from current markets would be great. But the biggest problem there is that how can you fix these prices for a longer term? As we saw in the graph that we have very high volatility. Um, so who is willing to provide you with PPA with fixed prices for such a long term that you can actually finance it? Uh, the banks need triple A parties back in your project, um, but also need to have this, the certainty that they have from the SDE, which is now for 15 to 16 years. How or, or which party can give you the same? 
guarantee, basically. Yeah, or will it lead to much lower leverage uh, ratios on the projects and hence also lower uh, returns on your project? Yeah. Using battery storage, um, maybe that's good also for the discussion later to hear how people see this case and how this could work for your solar project um, to make it work. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's, it's another additional investment. Um, which revenue streams would you get from this battery storage? And how can you integrate it with your business case to make it bankable? I would hear, love to hear more on uh, your opinion on that battery storage inclusion uh, later on than uh, Flores. Yeah. So we'll go back to the presentation. Yeah. And we'll have to wait uh, till my colleague Tom is going to switch screens. Um, because the battery storage, apparently, uh, a lot of people have it on their minds. Yeah. But it's it is you know it's a very interesting topic. We're going to organize a, a conference on it uh, on this topic in the end of March. Um, but do you see it on, as a solution on the short term? On the short term, it's very difficult to say. Um, maybe even longer term. The thing is with with solar and and you. Eh? In the answer we said for peak shaving only. Peak shaving only occurs in summer. So what means that you will just place a battery next to your solar project and you can only charge it with the peak shaving in the days that you have abundant sun. Um, meaning that let's say for six months uh, a year your battery is doing nothing. It's just standing there. Uh, so that, that, that wouldn't work. So that means you'll have to connect your battery also to the grid and make sure that you will be able to balance the grid and make your business case out of that. But does that really work? Uh, is that sufficient basically to make your project bankable? Um, that's up for discussion. And that's why it's interesting that you will have your uh, uh, the conference, which is a live conference, right? I think. I think yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, on, on, on this topic and to hear all the insights from the from the from the basically the, the, the new storage players in the, in the market. Yeah, well, we will uh, present uh, a power hour during that conference with a couple of uh, turnkey suppliers that will share their business case on how to make it work with, uh, with energy. Yeah. But that's not the topic uh, right here. Just you, you can uh, finish with your part of the conclusions. Exactly. Yeah. So so what do we see here? Well, of course, um, as I said in the beginning, we, we can't go into each topic uh, in detail now in this in this one hour that we have, basically. Um, but just to give a few insights, if we just, we can wait for lower EPC prices. Of course, we do expect prices to go down slightly, but he, well, at least towards the end of this year. Um, so it's all a combination of, of factors. Eh? Um, if you want to finance it, you either reduce your costs and your capex, or you increase your revenues. Um, so in, eh, reducing the cost, let's hope it will, uh, it will occur with, with current inflation uh, uh, numbers. You don't know. Um, use the current electricity prices. Yes and no. As I said, for the, for the, let's say for the next year, it might be very interesting. But how can you finance your project on a very long term? Uh, let's say 10 to 15 years, because that's a minimum term that you will need if you want to make it bankable. Uh, so you'll, have, you'll, you'll need to find a party uh, with either a direct or corporate PPA, which you see uh, increasing very fast in the Dutch market and the occurrence of, of, of corporate PPAs and also direct PPAs. Market parties, market players are looking for these kind of solutions um, and we see them popping up uh, every now and then in, in the market. So this, this is what I think is one of the key factors to get your project uh, bankable in the coming months. Um, grid sharing and, and, and energy clusters um, like I said, with the better battery storage, if it's only for solar, uh, it's a much more difficult business case, in my point of view, than combining it with uh, having storage, having solar, having wind, all on one grid connection, for example, um, and then adding storage, because then you can play around much more with the different production levels and the different production times that you have as well. So it's much easier to balance. Um, and you can, of course, split the, the cost of the, of the CAPEX, but also of the OPEX. Um, integrated systems is, is, is something, and so if, if you have a large scale 
let's say, energy landscape, eh, energy landscape, as, as we've seen developing in a few uh, parts of the country, they don't exist yet. Um, but this is something to think of, not only from a political view, but also from an investment point of view. If you combine all this and you have your hydrogen, for example, which a lot of attendees did not see as a uh, as a potential, but if we have new hydrogen capacity with even if it falls within the SDE system, you might be able to create one big energy landscape, and then it is financeable. So you don't look at a single uh, project financing for just a solar project anymore. But you try to combine it with different technologies, not only production but also storage and and offtake. So in a nutshell, uh, just to give you some insights how how we see the market developing and, and where and, and you know where in the market we see the potential. Uh, potential solutions. Um, that was my, uh, well, my conclusion for this uh, presentation. All right. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Floris. Very uh, clear. Um, we have time for a couple of questions right now, and then after the presentation, we will, and we can do a more general discussion. But um, I brought up uh, like a question with me. Um, the combination of solar and wind cable pooling and then adding storage to that. Um, are there many locations where this is possible? Is there is there a great potential for this in the Netherlands? There, there is a lot of potential because there is a lot of uh, existing wind parks already, for example, that have sufficient capacity on their uh, grid connection. So that already provides the, the opportunity. Uh, so the, the grid is already there, the connection is there. The transformers might have enough capacity or you might be able to expand it slightly but the combination of the production of solar and wind is basically ideal um, and if the peak would be too high for the grid that to that you won't be able to transport that part you can cover with storage or maybe even by placing an electrolyzer to produce hydrogen next to it do you have any numbers like how, how many megawatts could be potentially be built around wind uh, mill parks in the Netherlands? I don't have those numbers uh, uh, present, but looking at the projects that we are already looking at, uh, yeah, we're talking gigawatts. It's not just a few uh, a few megawatts. Okay, very interesting. Um, good. So let's. Um, yeah, one, one more question about that. Uh, the banks. Huh? You said the financing is, is 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 crucial, of course, and definitely if you're going into merchant solar, so not reliant on on SDE subsidies. Uh, there, of course, you need to have the banks along with um, yeah to get a financing for 10 to 15, which is a a, a challenge. And but I, I could imagine if you add storage to it, which is kind of a new technology in in, in the field. Um, are the banks ready to finance projects and then merchant and in adding storage? To, no, to be honest, I don't think so. Um, I, th I think if we look at merchant, yes, because they, the banks have a lot of experience already in Spain, uh, Portugal, Italy, uh, uh, with merchant BPAs and to finance these type of projects. But adding the storage to it has a much different uh, let's say project lifetime or certainty of income. Um, so it's something that you will probably have to, in the first years, would have to finance as a separate business case. Okay. This is different. You don't have, if, if you add storage or you, if you just place battery, you don't have a very fixed income as you do have with SDE or maybe partly with the merchant PPA. And, and, and would in, uh, the investment community have a, a stronger belief in this kind of business case. Could you finance these projects uh, without uh, bank financing, just 100% equity? Uh, if, if the investment community believes in the, in the future of business case, merchant solar, adding storage, etc., yeah, uh, would that be a, a possible solution? It is. Maybe not on the very large scale, huh? because you still need to, the, well, the capex is still very high. Um, but, but yes, uh, so you won't finance like a solar project 90%. Um, but you might be able to uh, to finance, let's say, half with the bank and half by equity. Um, but the potential returns should be higher as well. Okay, and with current pricing, then we're back in the in the discussion. The current pricing of the EPC and the margin is too too small to make it attractive to make it attractive for direct and uh, equity investors. 
if, if, if we're talking solar project, yes. Yeah. yeah. Therefore, you can still need the bank. All right. Thanks for us for now. We'll come back to you later. Um, and before we go to the next speaker, um, we'll have a poll question again. Um, so please join us in this uh, webinar and, and join with your opinion on the question. What do you see as the major opportunities in the Dutch market? Um, is that the innovative double land use of projects like floating PV or agrivoltaics? Are these uh, the rising energy prices driving the business case for solar PV? Uh, do you see corporate PPAs as the major opportunity or maybe new structures? Uh, Flores touched upon this, the energy hubs, the ESCO financing, etc. Or maybe the potential extra government budget for climate action has been uh, promised by our new government with, uh, that they're going to put an emphasis and put more efforts on climate change uh, activities and support. So please make your votes. And then in the meantime, Willem, are you there? Yes, good morning. I'm here. Good morning, Willem. Yes, nice to have you here. Um, Willem, you're going to discuss some of these uh, topics and then we have already the votes. Um, welcome. Is there any any positive news that, uh, that you came across uh, recently that you say, okay, that gives hope for the Dutch market because Flores also was a, a little bit uh, cautious about the opportunities uh, with uh, the rising EPC pricing prices. Is there anything good uh, that you can share upfront from your presentation? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good question. I don't know. I don't see anything really great um, okay. at the moment. Uh, there is a, there's still a lot, uh, yeah, a lot of work to do, and uh, especially around policy and SD. And I will touch upon that in, in my presentation as well. But yeah, uh, higher uh, EPC prices um, and cost of materials, um, as was also mentioned by Flores. I mean, that's not going down that quickly, so we won't see uh, any major change there, I think, in the near future. Um, good news, yeah, I guess new markets, uh, as in, and that was also, uh, I guess, clear in the, uh, the polls so far, um, obviously around PPAs, that yeah, will be more interesting. And you see it here as well in this poll question as, as sort of the, yeah, uh, divided second uh, ranked um, uh, and battery storage. I think that's also another market that will uh, will open up in the next couple of years uh, and will become more important than uh, uh, in combination with uh, again what Flores mentioned before with solar projects uh, and, and uh, wind uh, combinations to um, uh, yeah to drive that market because I think there will be uh, some some good opportunities there. Okay, well, I uh, see my colleague Tom already switched uh, the, the, the slides, so you can take it ahead. The floor is yours, Evan. Yes, thank you, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining uh, the Solar Plaza webinar. Um, I'll first explain a bit about the story of Groenleven. Um, some of you may have heard that before, but uh, and in a simple graph, I guess I wanted to show you how, it's, uh, how Groenleven has grown uh, from a small company and basically from two people back in 2012 to uh, about 160, 170 uh, today um, in the solar market, operating in the solar market primarily still, although uh, since the beginning of this year we have become 100% um, BIWA RE, which means we will also, we will also focus a lot more on um, other energy solutions and not just solar. So. Uh, that's, I guess, anticipating also the changing landscape in this uh, in this market in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, we've started obviously a lot uh, with solar um, and very much on the rooftop side um, back in the days, uh, 10 years ago, uh, developed that uh, really well um, with a small group of people and then also looked at larger scale projects. Um, and mostly, and, and already, yeah, uh, I guess uh, five, six years ago, seven years ago, looking at sort of more double use of space. So carports um, along uh, along the highway, uh, the uh, uh, the sound barriers uh, the, the, uh, on top of um, waste um, dumps, uh, those kind of uh, applications to make double use of, of uh, the available land. Uh, the Netherlands is a small country, so looking at those sort of innovative innovative solutions uh, uh, has been a big part of uh, Groenleven and obviously uh, uh, I should mention floating as well. Uh, that's how when I joined Groenleven back in 2018 uh, where we developed the first floating solar uh, um, park here in, in Friesland uh, where we operate 
and yeah, in the meantime, uh, we've we've constructed uh, 11 floating solar uh, um, parks. So that development has been incredible as well, and uh, all you know, obviously with the help of uh, the SDE subsidy, an important magnet, I think, for international developers, for local developers, uh, to construct and uh, uh, develop projects. So, uh, and and I saw that in the previous poll as well, uh, a lot of uh, you, I guess, chose grid issues. Uh, yes, that's another uh, big issue, and we'll see uh, another image of that later on in my presentation. Uh, and the second one being the SDE, uh, uh, that could be a big risk for the market. And I also would like to go uh, into a little bit more detail on that side. So, in terms of Groenlever, uh, um, added double functions here, uh, a car producer was one of the first ones, if not the first one, at least from a Groenlever perspective. Um, it's the sort of it's not so much carport it's more motor uh, port so to speak for uh, at the tt um, uh, motor racing circuit in in Asse. um and making double use of the land space and uh, a great parking space for the uh, motorbikes although probably not a lot of them are electric uh, yet but uh, yeah, i guess development's going that way as well um the other one we just shown is uh, the airport uh, at ilde in groningen um, another wonderful solution where, uh, yeah, sort of unused parts of uh, of lands on an airport can be used for uh, solar generation as well. So, fantastic solution in those type of locations. Floating, uh, obviously have to mention that. Um, yeah, a great innovation and solution for uh, uh, sort of unused water. Um, and we've been focusing on uh, sand pits primarily so far, but uh, obviously, that development will also expand to other types of water. Um, but yeah, uh, here shown the uh, Bomhofs Plus uh, on the north side of Zwolle in the Netherlands uh, back then in 2020. So uh, yeah, just under two years ago, uh, the biggest outside of uh, Asia uh, um, and finalizing the construction here, as you may be able to see. But uh, a wonderful project, 27 megawatt uh, and currently owned by the local energy corporation which I guess is also linked with um, sort of market developments. Um, and no grid issues here uh, back then, but um, yeah, we do face grid issues, obviously in a lot of projects uh, we are developing at the moment. The next is another wonderful example of, let's say innovative use of la uh, lands or double use of lands. Uh, I agree, uh, Agri PV, I agree, uh, Agri uh, Photovoltaics, um, as we mentioned before as well. Um, this is a project in Babarich, sort of, um, yeah, uh, further south in the Netherlands uh, for raspberries, if I'm correct. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's an excellent use of, uh, uh, of the space, um, uh, generating energy, um, protecting the crop, uh, making it much nicer for uh, the, um, uh, the people who have to um, yeah, pick the fruits uh, to work underneath solar modules instead of uh, the, the the plastic uh, setup you see there which is normal for those kind of uh, plantations so uh, um, all in all and, and the crop still generates the, the, the same kind of yield uh, and and more constant actually as we've um, researched so or as, as, as we've seen so far so that's um, yeah a really big bonus and, and that's even multiple use of uh, of that space or uh, multifunctional use of that space because uh, it's got a lot of advantages However, yeah, it's also more costly. Um, it's not uh, yeah, the same as a full uh, uh, piece of agricultural land uh, with large uh, solar fields. Uh, this is more costly. It's a different type of construction. And more importantly, um, the solar modules are obviously not um, fully, yeah, let's say, closed. They need to also leave some light through. So they've got less solar cells. Um, hence, yeah, you generate a little bit less uh, power per um, per square meter or per uh, per area than than normal, and and the modules are a bit more expensive. So, SDE in this case, you know, really helps to uh, to uh, yeah uh, construct these projects and uh, and and finance these projects, but uh, certainly very very thin uh, thin business case um, even with a good SDE, uh, and that's also where we see a bit of the danger uh, coming. In the Dutch market, um, uh, uh, as I guess was clear in the poll, yes, grid connection or grid congestion is is a major issue. Um, however, also SDE, 
and as the at the moment uh, as Flores has shown as well and I think my, there will be a few slides sort of showing the same kind of thing but uh, will be is going down or has gone down um, and will only go down further um, the expectation is that probably 2025 it might even be gone um, uh, but yeah what we also have seen is indeed lowering lower EPC costs but that's probably for the main, you know, for the bigger projects. Um, if you look at these kind of innovations like uh, agri-PV um, floating, you still need, um, they're more costly uh, to uh, to create, uh, but also, I guess, you know, more innovative and more integrated into the landscape. Um, but SDE will, SD will, will, will go um, one of the, um, uh, at some point, and, and one of the, uh, the fears we, we see is that, um, yeah, it shouldn't be closed, you know, suddenly. That will have a major impact, uh, I think, on the Dutch market. Um, there should be a, yeah, some sort of smooth transition from SDE to another type of, um, you know, um, let's say scenario. Um, otherwise, the, uh, yeah, the continuity of the, the Dutch solar market, uh, I think, will, uh, we think, will certainly be in, in danger. So uh, a backup plan is, is needed to uh, still sort of provide financing security for um, um, you know, for these type of solar projects, or for you know, renewable energy projects in general. Um, as people may know, the current or the last SDE round uh, was oversubscribed massively. Uh, I think about 12 billion uh, for a pot of um, 5 billion um, for uh, available. So uh, a lot of projects will um, will not be granted SDE um, coming out of the last round. So. Yes, there will be another round mid this year. So I think a few projects will obviously go over to the to the new round uh, SD. But um, yeah, there's a lot more uncertainty that these type of projects will um, will be granted SD, as the focus is more on reducing CO2, CO2 uh, emissions and other types of technology and um, uh, like you know CO2 storage, which um, yeah uh, is also not really a, a proven uh, a solution yet. And it will take some time to to develop. So um, that's one of the dangers we see. Uh, and yes, uh, the, uh, I said 2025 roughly, uh, because that's probably um, when we expect to reach the 35 terawatt hours, as agreed in the climate agreement. Uh, although um, I think it's much, yeah, there will much more will be needed uh, to achieve uh, um, yeah, the renewable energy target because. Uh, the demand will only increase further, and 35 terawatt hours will not uh, will not be enough to uh, to keep up with the target. So that's very important um, to have, like I mentioned before, a sort of a smooth transition after SDE to keep these projects alive. Because bearing in mind um, that the apart from EPC costs increasing uh, and, and SDE lowering, um, the complexity of projects has also become um, um, yeah, they have become more complex. Um, there's a lot more involvement from local community. There's a lot more opposition. Uh, there's obviously the grid uh, congestion issues. So um, it has become harder and harder. And I've seen it in the last uh, couple of years as well with Groenlewe to uh, to develop and um, and and uh, re realize projects uh, because of these yeah additional factors, more um, more rules and. Yeah, more difficulties with um, authorities, uh, local authorities uh, like local governments, provincial governments, um, that make it harder for projects to uh, uh, to come off the ground. So, um, in that sense, we do need some. Uh, we think, as a market, some support on that side as well, in terms of some transition from SD to other um, to another type of yeah support financing. Um, well, I don't want to go into. It, in, too much. Uh, Flora's also touched on this. Um, I guess what I simply wanted to show, indeed, is lowering SDEs, lowering EPC costs, but slowly starting to rise again recently, uh, as, as, as uh, Flora showed as well before. And um, uh, well, the uh, the 2025 is sort of the idea that uh, that SDE will will be gone by then. So uh, making sure we are uh, well positioned for that to uh, to continue. Again, in another way, the EPC cost reduction. Yes, um, we have achieved cost reduction. And if I only look at specifically floating in my case, um, and that started out uh, obviously pretty expensive, the first project. Um, 
However, we have managed to reduce that to almost half of what the original EPC costs were. So uh, a great development and only possible with SDE uh, support, uh, so to speak, uh, to create a bankable uh, product. Um, and yeah, I guess bigger is better. Uh, and, and also touched upon uh, briefly by uh, Flores and, and, and uh, um, is the, the the energy landscape, so to speak. So the bigger projects, instead of having scattered, you know, smaller projects around the country, I think uh, um, as a country uh, we should look at those sort of bigger uh, projects to um, yeah to make it more feasible and combine them, not just solar. Uh, that's um, uh, but with wind, with battery storage, uh, with hydrogen storage or production, electrolyzers, um, nature, uh, ecological aspects, um, everything combined in sort of the bigger uh, projects to um, yeah to achieve targets as well and have less sort of local um, um, opposition. Um, yeah, make it easier in that respect. Um, yeah, what are the trends uh, in terms of international versus local investment or um, uh, uh, the business case for Groenlevy is usually uh, or, or Bioa at the um, we do the full development cycle or uh, from uh, development to construction to operation and then sell projects uh, obviously attracts a lot of international investors uh, however we also see now a trend more and more towards local investors and especially um, let's say the local energy corporations so that's another dimension yeah, that has been added uh, it helps a lot in more local uh, acceptance uh, for these type of projects which yeah then makes it easier for example on the uh, the permitting side uh, with the local governments uh, because you know then there's more acceptance by the local community uh, sort of having the feeling that obviously the money uh, or the yeah the, the 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 flow of money is kept locally um so that's yeah that's a trend we see and we've got a couple of projects uh, that we've um, sold to local um, energy corporations so i think a great trend um not sure how sustainable it is because yeah uh, finding the, like purchasing these kind of projects by local energy corporations is uh, obviously not a yeah uh not an easy thing and uh, you need some expertise expertise on that side as well um, you know um what else do we have here yeah the the the, the wonderful map that people may be familiar with at uh, the the grid connection uh, is this a financing risk yes it is partly but um, it also provides opportunities um, again also what flores mentioned previously uh, looking at for example battery storage um, you know with um, with renewable energy projects so but certainly a big issue part of it um, i think is let's say paper-based eh, congestion um, so i think there are developments that um, they're opening up the lines a bit more so it frees up some more space for projects uh, but yeah um, something that um, obviously will take time before we are back to um, an easier grid uh, and interesting obviously to see uh, which i always find is the red yellow uh, orange is on the east side of the netherlands where you know least people live but where all the projects are or all the bigger projects are and uh, the electricity is needed on the west side of the netherlands in the bigger cities on the coast so um, a lot of work to be doing to be done there Future developments, I guess I touched upon it and it's been touched upon before. Um, yeah, there are a lot of projects scattered around the country in all kinds of shapes. Um, and um, yeah, uh, again, I think one of the developments we see um, in the market is uh, yeah, going towards bigger energy landscapes, um, combining, as mentioned uh, before, um, multiple types of renewable energy, um, like solar, like wind, like battery storage, um, and any other uh, type of, I guess, um, solution uh, in combination with, yeah, ecological aspects, um, you know, to combine a, um, a fully integrated energy landscape um, uh, in a bigger way. So you've got bigger energy hubs basically around the country instead of the scattered um, um, smaller you know, solar parks or, or wind parks. Uh, um, in the country um, I think that was nearly that was the end of my um, my presentation or my my, my chat um, yeah happy to uh, to uh, have any questions um, and keen to hear uh, yeah what people think thank you
Thanks, Willem. Um, I think uh, my colleague uh, Tom can put up a poll question because the last slide that you presented is quite an interesting one. You touched upon like the, the increasing complexity uh, with local stakeholders um, and you picked it up maybe uh, to, keep, to make it interesting, to keep it interesting and to really go for the energy transition, we need bigger projects. And then I'm talking about like, I think hundreds of megawatts scale combination of wind, solar, etc. Uh, to make that happen. Um, so what is the uh, opinion of, the, of our audience? <clears throat> Sorry, uh, what do you see as the future of the Dutch solar development? Should it be big scale energy landscapes, really big, multi hundreds, hundreds of megawatts or even gigawatts scale projects in a few places in the, uh, in the Netherlands? Um, or should it be more small scale and local, a park for every village? Uh, solar park for every village okay please uh, share your votes and let's see what you think uh, will be the future in in um, in the meantime okay there we have uh so willem it seems like complexity is on <laughs> there will be yeah. more complexity in the market because uh, a majority two-thirds of the audience believes and i think uh, among them are quite some uh, relevant stakeholders in the dutch market believe that uh, the future might be more small scale and local. So that means the involvement of the energy cooperatives, um, the yeah. uh, municipalities, etc. Yeah, yeah, and that's obviously, I'm not saying that's wrong eh? and, and, and that the, the bigger um, uh, landscapes are the solution uh, or, or the only solution, absolutely. Like if you do it locally, um, and I'm, I'm living in a village where it also happens, uh, yeah, where uh, I think a four megawatt solar park is, is uh, being developed um, next to the village for local use by the local energy corporation. Uh, although I do see as well that um, they really have a hard time in, I guess, also generating some focus and, uh, and speed in that process because these are people that have a normal job uh, and trying to, uh, to arrange these solar parks. I mean, if, if it's coming from an energy corporation. Obviously, if you look at the developers, then yes, it's important to, uh, to hook in with local um interest groups local energy corporations to um, um yeah to get these kind of um, uh, renewable energy projects off the ground and uh, and gain local acceptance but um, yeah surely a way to do it um to keep them close to let's say um yeah communities and i think yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things you hear um when you do talk to people about solar i mean when i when i joined for like uh, and before that as well but um <clears throat> Who can be against solar? I mean, solar power is fantastic. It's, you know, we need it. It's renewable energy. That's the way to go. But yeah, you do see more and more resistance and it's usually um, the point of not in my backyard. Um, so people do uh, do resist and it's usually also the people with the, <clears throat> let's say, the biggest mouth who cause the, uh, the biggest problems uh, or, or can lengthen those procedures. So local presence, local, um, 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 yeah, local partnerships are very important in that uh, in that in that case. I think. Um, yeah. So um, when I hear your presentation and that uh, that of Flores, and I put myself in a more uh, independent position, um, I could say that well, it's kind of a negative sentiment in the market right now. You know, APC prices going up. The, you mentioned the, the enormous complexity, the growth in complexity, all these local stakeholders, people with a big mouth, <laughs> trying to uh, <laughs> stop project developments. Um, yeah, SDE massively oversubscribed and a focus on uh, COT storage and other solutions. Is there still room to build projects in, uh, in the Netherlands this year? Are you going to still develop uh, projects that are really coming off the ground? Yeah, no, we are still fortunately. So no, it's not all bad news. <laughs> Certainly not. Um, but let's say the... I'd say it's late. the glory days are over, I think. Uh, but th th that also obviously uh, creates... Um, well, this kind of, I think it's sort of a tipping point at the moment, the market. Uh, what we've seen with Corona as well hasn't obviously helped. Um, and the other factors that, that have that have been discussed today, um, sort of now I think we're in sort of a shift in the market to, yeah, what's the next, I guess, big thing and how can we continue the energy transition? Because like I mentioned, I think if, uh, for example, the SDE goes out or, um, yeah, I, I even heard rumors that they want to put um, nuclear power into the SDE uh, uh, fund. It's yeah, then then I think it's lost. Um, yeah, but <laughs> we still have a big um, um, yeah big gap to fill. So uh, there's certainly then 
I think now it, it, it's, uh, what is it, um, forces uh, developers as well to think differently and to look at other opportunities. And, and there are certainly other opportunities. I mean, uh, uh, what was mentioned before uh, in the polls as well, um, maybe you, the, the battery storage, I think, is the next, yeah, I think is the next big thing uh, with hydrogen um, and those kind of solutions to, um, uh, to still meet the energy or you know, the climate agreement targets um, and, okay. and push ahead. But um, a bit more complexity, okay. but yeah, that's also you know a, a great challenge to uh, that we accept more, more complexity more challenge more fun let's also bring back flores into the game uh flores please uh, join in the discussion some questions coming in and uh i see some familiar names in uh, around the question um the may, oscars may I, may I just add something to the previous one Edwin? yeah to, of course, to, give go ahead. Note, to give it a positive note as well <laughs> um as i as i said in the last 15 years in solar in europe we saw many companies, developers, other, other players in the market disappear at the moment that the subsidy was gone or the subsidy began too low. I think we are in the Dutch market in the lucky position that if we are enough that, and smart enough that we can actually, you know, cover that, let's say, gap in, in, in subsidy by, you know, being smart uh, and, and having electricity prices that are high enough and to be able to compensate that gap. Maybe. Yeah. So we're, it's possible we're as we, have to be, we have to be a bit, you know, more innovative. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We have three more years to go, right? Uh, in, three, in three more years, we have to have uh, found a solution. Yeah. Um, let's, a lot let's bring in three a, years. Yeah. Let's bring in a question. There is uh, so from familiar names. Uh, Roland de Vlam is also there joining. I can, let, let me see, Roland, if we can hear your voice as well, so that you can personally ask your question. Are you there, Roland? Roland? Uh, yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> Good morning, okay. everybody. Hi, Roland. You, uh, you had uh, two questions I sent in. Please go ahead, Roland. Yeah, the one is a bit of a joke, but it was just um, uh, uh, on, on Flores' um, uh, remark. I agree, by the way, but that uh, legislation is, is lagging behind and that, uh, that the market is going more quickly than 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 uh, the legislation, but I was just thinking, and I was just thinking, who is who is slower or more conservative, uh, legislation or bankers? Uh, <laughs> bankability standard is to a large extent, perhaps too large extent, depending on legislation and not so much market opportunities. That's uh, more. Yeah, it's not only legislation; it's it's more risk averseness, right? So which go hand in hand with the legislation probably. But yeah, I, I agree. Changing things changes, you know, changes the view of the banks as well. Um, yeah, let's say it's, it's you know, what, what we always, always wanted is to have government and legislations with a long-term view and a long-term plan. That, that no, always, I think, what, what I'm sort of saying is that, I mean, in the, in the beginning, a couple of years back, solar was more adventurous than it is today. The market is much more mature. Technology is much more mature. Um, EPC prices have well gone down and 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 will probably stabilize a bit. Uh, the market is much more stable uh, than it used to be. And uh, and do you see uh, let's say in that sense growing confidence from from financiers from lenders that make them less dependent perhaps on subsidies legislation. That sort of stuff. Is there a sort of a balance in that, or do you see the same position from bankers that they used to have five, six, five years ago? Yeah, I wouldn't say that has changed a lot actually, um, because of the SDE being in place eh? and all the other things, all the other changes in legislation, basically just supported it. Um, so we don't see a lot of change there, but it. it you know, it, it is, as, as Willem said, we're on a tipping point. So, you know, there will be a lot of changes in the coming two to three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Think, um, my, my, oh, sorry, Willem, do you have something to add? No, 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 go ahead. If you have uh, one last remark, uh, fine. No, no, no. I, I, my, my, my other question was um, uh, about your solution. Uh, or your solution or your, your, your direction of solutions in integrating more multiple technologies and, uh, and, and, and integrate and, and, and having uh, consumers and storage and hydrogen all 
together to yeah, and but that, obviously that will increase a sort of interface risk and how do you see that that's yeah, a good question yeah it, it does yes. of course huh? um but if if that is needed to get these projects financed and realized um i think we need some smart lawyers probably to cover the legal aspects uh, do you yeah <laughs> I think technically it's certainly possible yeah, um, uh, to do that. I mean, if you look at wind and solar, for example, just that combination, and you see that more and more fortunately uh, on one connection, but the profiles are so uh, uh, complementary. That's 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 unbelievable. So uh, that's almost a no-brainer and, and can work really well. Combined with battery storage, I don't think there would be major issues either. Um, uh, and that's all, yeah, technically, resolvable uh but indeed and yeah on the financing side and you know the risks uh, covering those risks that's uh, that's the next thing then okay thanks very lot for your uh, contribution uh look forward to see you at one of our next events and uh, i'll go over to the next question which was sent in by janos uh, he says like ppas are already available utility or corporate and off takers will likely want to play yeah, to pay ppa prices close to market price levels uh, they don't want to um, more just uh, because of the SDE tariff decreases or diminishes uh, and this SDE goes down. So would it be interesting to see how the lack of SDE uh, tariffs will impact bankability and project economics? So what do you think of yeah, these PPAs? It was mentioned also by you, uh, Flores. Um, what, what, what's your opinion? Is it going to uh, rapidly increase and what kind of corporates do you see with an interest in these uh, PPAs? It, it is rapidly increasing. Um, many corporate PPAs have been uh, closed in the last uh, few months. Of course, large corporates are facing these increased uh, electricity prices on the market as well. And uh, a nice corporate PPA or direct PPA gives them the opportunity to fix basically their, uh, their electricity prices for a longer term. Um, so yes, I see a, a large increase and this is needed, I think, to cover the gap of the uh, in the SDE tariffs. And if you're really lucky, you have an SDE tariff that basically covers the downside as well. That's now, but, sort of guarantee. Yeah. What, what kind of tariffs, before I go to you, Willem, but what kind of uh, terms do you see for these PPAs? How long are corporates willing to, uh, to sign? Or for what, what kind of period? Up to them. Eh? The, the, the thing is that they were used, most large corporates, the corporates were used uh, to have quite short-term PPAs, let's say three years, um, most of their electricity usage against uh, variable prices. Yeah, they, they didn't hedge or fix uh, a lot of their electricity usage. But if you're being faced now with your electricity bill going up four to five times, uh, then you might start to think different and think, hey, I need, first of all, I need to fix my price to, to protect uh, myself against uh, uh, all these influences uh, of further increasing prices um, and if you can get a renewable PPA uh, it would even be better right if it, if it is sort of a local production uh, facility if it's wind or solar or if it's next to your factory or your offices um, it also has quite a marketing uh, value of course yeah, but is, is it like uh, are, are corporates willing to sign for 10 years and would that be sufficient for financing? Um, we do see interest even for 15 years. Uh, 15 years. You try, uh, yes, that you, that you, that basically you try to match sort of an SDE kind of product. Same on your side, Willem? Yeah, correct. Indeed. I mean, at the moment, especially yeah, because it's sort of linked to the SDE period. So um, 15 years is uh, is not uncommon. Uh, but I think after SDE, indeed, that, that could be more flexible, but uh, especially the bigger corporates, I think, would uh, would go for the longer term uh, security, uh, depending on the, um, yeah, on the, on, on the content of the, the PPA. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's important for, uh, for these kind of uh, uh, businesses or companies to have a longer term, longer term security uh, around that. But do you think that the, the, the market and, and you as stakeholders and everybody would be ready to make that shift uh, if we do two gigawatts a year right now to shift completely from SDE dependence to, to corporate PPAs and, and that the banks and everybody is ready to, uh, to roll over to, uh, into PPAs? Not in overnight. Years? 
Yeah, in three years, well, indeed, not overnight. So in, in the next couple of years, that shift has to be made. So that's one of those sort of, I think, tipping points that needs to happen in the market, um, aside from other, uh, let's say, technical changes and um, uh, ideas. But yeah, that's on the PPA side the same um, thing to, to, to make that shift from a post-SDE um, or a post-subsidy era. Uh, you're right. Flores, you're also convinced that that is possible? Yes. Yeah, definitely. We all we already see, um, as I said, a, a large increase in the market in corporate PPAs being signed. Um, but th th this is yeah, it's increasing very fast. But of course, as Willem says, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, you need the banks as well, but they are also willing. Um, so we we do see this as a as a very quick development. Uh, uh, in the next few months, you will see a lot more about this. Yeah. Um, another question that came in that, uh, that is non-related to the PPAs, but it's a question, what is the biggest challenge for Dutch markets uh, for connecting hydrogen into solar and hybrid projects? Willem, I'll start with you. What is the biggest challenge to your opinion? Yeah, the biggest challenge at the moment, I think, is also the, um, uh, let's say, the market for um, uh, hydrogen supply, like to, uh, the, to have uh, what is it, hydrogen uh, carriers to 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 use it basically like um, uh, that's that's obviously very low at the moment uh, yes the trend is towards more um, hydrogen based well let's say trucks or uh, factories um, I think about um, what is it uh, Tata Steel I guess trying to go that way uh, so but obviously it, it does require a lot of um, uh, energy uh, and perhaps yeah, preferably green energy, uh, but the point is that it needs to have a constant supply of uh, of energy, and let's say solar can't you know provide that uh, all the time, obviously. So um, that would need, I think, in my opinion, a combination of of wind and solar, for example, or a different kind of uh, yeah mix of supply to uh, to realize that. So that's definitely one of the challenges at the moment, eh? and we are doing a small scale. Um, a pilot uh, with that, uh, as you may know. So, yeah, it's also a lot of learning there, and that's still a very immature market uh, for now. But uh, yeah, I think big developments to come as well. Flores, anything uh, that you are? Uh, is there any interest from the stakeholders that you're working with on, yeah, adding a, a green hydrogen production uh, to the power plants? Yes. Yeah, but I agree with with Willem. So, so it's basically the ideal picture. You have your solar park. Maybe you're not even able to connect it, or there's a the, the connection is way too small. That you basically put your electrolyzer next to it, and you produce uh, hydrogen at the moment the sun is shining. That's that's sort of an ideal picture. Uh, but then you have the problem of how to get this hydrogen out of there. You're only producing in summer. Um, you know, so that then. You go more towards indeed the combination of wind and solar or other types you know that have a constant supply yeah all right um let, yeah we're running out of time but let me uh, just post uh, or ask you one more question which is um may, maybe more a question related to the sentiment that uh, currently a lot of the investments made in the netherlands are coming from abroad uh, from from foreign investors um Compared to the other side, you see the local interest, the growing local interest from local stakeholders like these, these cooperatives. Um, what, what is your your feeling toward uh, uh, about this sentiment? Is there a resistance against a growing resistance against foreign investors, or is that a non-issue at all? Uh, Floor, start with you. Well, if, if there is growing resistance, then they should call us. Um, <laughs> It's one of the reasons, of course, that we started the Matos dialogue. We saw, at the moment we started, we saw only foreign investors active in the market, basically. Um, and I would say foreign investors have much more uh, um, difficulties with cooperating with the local cooperation, for example. Uh, if it is a part that's 50% owned by a, by a local corporation, or maybe even by the landowner, or wh wh whichever local stakeholder is involved, um, then it becomes less attractive for large foreign funds. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, um, that, that's how the economy works. If, uh, if someone is able to provide capital against a, a, a lower um, discount rate, then, yeah, the project goes to, uh, to a foreign party. But 
um, you know, that's what, what we are trying to do with Klimaat van Nederland is to be able to uh, to beat those terms as well and to uh, well to make it the Dutch part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Willem, I, uh, is this one of the increases in complexity for companies like uh, Groenlever with the, the strong ties to Bayer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, but Groenlever is also not. I will. It's it's obviously owned 100 percent by Bayer, so uh, yes, there is some foreign influence there. But uh, uh, all the people working here, are obviously uh, uh, Dutch, and um, we think it's very important um, to at least to keep that connection with uh, uh, with the local energy corporations uh, and as i said uh, before and 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 yeah we've got a, a couple of examples now where uh, local energy corporations have bought uh, energy assets or solar assets so that's a, i think that's a very good thing um because indeed it it increases the acceptance uh, by the local community um albeit yeah you won't be able to please everybody um because besides i guess having this local um involvement and and and, and uh, good connection with uh, with the local energy corporations and therefore also helps with permitting as i said before um uh, to get these projects off the ground um other things you know you hear is like yeah but the modules are still coming from china um you know there's still uh, romanians or pol polish uh, uh, you know construction teams uh, working here so it's yeah there's always something to complain about but um indeed uh, like uh, like flora said uh, yes if um, uh, there will always be an inter international investors uh, who are drawn to this market and um, uh, okay. will still be there but um, i think the trend is yeah towards more local um, investment yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, we're an open society, we're an open country, uh, so we, we're dependent also on the foreign uh, cooperation. So, uh, to my opinion, I would say that that, that is inevitable, that this is, this is happening, and also these foreign investors uh, yeah, stimulated and uh, sparked the market in the, in the first place. Absolutely. So, that's, that's also a good uh, thing. Okay, um, gentlemen, I, we, we have to finish this webinar, we're running towards the end. Um, uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, concluding that, despite some of the negative trends like EPC pricing, etc., it's, it's still good to hear that you're positive and optimistic about optimistic about the opportunities. Also, betting on the in innovative uh, skills of the Dutch uh, to find new ways to finance projects, uh, even if the SDE will disappear in 2025, and there is a even maybe nuclear added to the SDE portfolio. Let's let's pray that that's never going to happen. But that's a personal yeah. opinion. Um, but we'll we'll be innovative and uh, corporate PPAs is a rising topic, something to watch out for, maybe a good topic to discuss at uh, our conference coming up in June, the Dutch conference. And the other topic, of course, as mentioned, uh, energy storage, 29th of March, we'll have hopefully um, the, the first uh, live event again in the Netherlands on, on this topic where we'll discuss this business case. So thank you, Willem. Thank you, uh, Floris, for contributing to this webinar. And thank you, audience, for joining us. And uh, I don't know if my colleague Tom will bring up a last slide, if there is any last slides, but uh, I'm leaving you with the message that the, the slides and uh, the full recordings will be made available so that you can share with anyone interested. Thank you very much for joining and looking forward to a Thank live you. session very soon. Bye-bye.